so again, welcome you know, to our talk on uh, fairy tales. This is a five seminar series that we're doing you know, approximately every two to three weeks you know, through the, the fall time here. We are continuing a new model. Many of you remember that you know, uh, earlier in the year we did a series on alchemy. We did five or six you know, seminars on alchemy. Had a really nice turnout. People really enjoyed the, the seminar series. And we're contemplating doing a fall and a spring you know, series you know, of events. So the last one was spring. This one is absolutely fall. We're doing five uh, every two to sometimes it'll be three or four weeks uh, seminars on a topic. This one is on fairy tales. We're considering you know, doing the uh, psychology of religion. You may do some religious themes you know, starting in next spring. So that could be uh, in January. We'll talk more about that later. So today is number one of five. Our presenter is Murray Stein. And he will be talking today on the psychology of fairy tales, and particularly Maria Louise von Franz and her work on fairy tales. You'll see an image there of her on the screen, a very animated image, and she's clearly making a point. And we will be talking more uh, about Maria Louise von Franz. Murray Stein is today's presenter. Uh, I will be the host, and Ryan Deegan is the technician. He may be jumping in when there's technical issues to correct or work, or work on. We have a number of countries participating, which is always an honor to have so many people worldwide. Today we have people from Australia, Canada, Hong Kong, Iceland, Ireland, Japan, Mexico, the Netherlands, Slovenia, Slovakia, Sweden, Switzerland, Ukraine, United Kingdom, and of course the U.S. And we always make a point to read the countries because it is such a delight to have people from all around the world participating. That's really been our vision from the very beginning of this project. Today's seminars are 90 minutes. We will uh, try to do questions. You probably remember our seminars used to be three hours in length, uh, which was great, plenty of time for questions. But for a webinar, people thought that was too long. So instead, we cut them down to 90 minutes, which was the preferred length you know, by viewers in a questionnaire. Um, but we spread them out to have more seminars. Um, so we may be able to do a few questions, but we won't do as many questions as we've done historically. But please do send questions regardless. And if we have time, we'll break in and ask those questions. They can be emailed to info at AshevilleYoungCenter.org, but better is to hit the, uh, the question button. There's a, a button on your uh, viewer that you can ask questions with. So do that if you're able to figure that out. Hopefully, you've already set up your audio or you can't hear my voice right now. But if you can't hear my voice and you can read the screens, make sure that you've clicked the microphone and speakers button or the telephone. Some people call in and use their telephone for the audio if you have a, a poor internet connection. Um, but usually, microphone and speakers are the optimal you know, one for the majority of people. Do play around with the features a little bit on your computer. Make sure you hit the full screen mode. You can toggle and, and drag the, the screens for the presenters to make the slides bigger or smaller and to make the video image of uh, Dr. Stein bigger or smaller as well. The next event in the series, remember it's a five seminar series, will be number two, of course. It will also feature Murray Stein and will be on October 11th of this year. John Hill will be joining us for the last two. So of the five events, the first three are pure Murray Stein. And the last two will be uh, primarily John Hill, and Murray may participate in you know, some of those as well. But John will be joining us you know, for the last two. We are taping today, so realize that if you'd like to remain anonymous, please state so on your question. So if you don't want your name or country read off on your question, just say anonymous. I'll, we'll make sure not to read it. Otherwise, we'd like to say who's asking the question and what country you're from. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Murray Stein. Uh, most of you know Murray. He's been our lead presenter for six years at Asheville Young Center. I think maybe a few of the, the newer folks here. He is a supervising training analyst and former president of the International School of, a of Analytical Psychology, Zurich, known as ISAP Zurich. He's the author of Principles of Individuation, as well as Minding the Self, which I meant to, to write on there, but it looks like I didn't type it. Out. Um, uh, but anyway, there's an a image of his most recent book, which is Minding the Self, which is a wonderful book published through Rutledge. If you get a chance to look through that, uh, that is good. He's also edited a series on fairy tales, you know, which you probably noticed in the emails. 
uh, published by Chiron Publications, and we strongly recommend you look through some of those books as well because it, it mirrors some of the material we're doing too. And he presently resides in Switzerland outside of Zurich. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Murray Stein. Thank you, Murray. Steve asked me to say something about uh, my background today. Uh, generally, I've held these seminars in my library with a bunch of books behind me. Uh, this is a uh, um, being filmed in, in uh, actually in my dining room in Goldingville, Switzerland, near Thun, just above Lake Thun, in the middle of Switzerland. And uh, it's from a Chinese temple, an old one, old carving, uh, that reads Old White Plum Tree Temple. So just for your information, so you know what that is in the background. Um, our seminar series is going to be uh, titled A Jungian Approach to the Interpretation of Fairy Tales. And um, well, it's a series of, of five, as uh, Steve mentioned, five seminars, and this is the first one. Um, and in this series, <clears throat> uh, we'll try to answer a couple of basic questions um, that uh, may uh, have come to your mind um, unless you're very familiar with the field of analytical psychology and, and uh, Jungian thought already. Um, but we'll try to answer the question of why uh, Jungians study fairy tales and read them. Uh, nearly all the training programs in the world, I would imagine, Jungian training programs have courses in interpretation of fairy tales. Why is that? Um, a second question we'll try to answer is how do we interpret them? What is the method of interpretation? I will address that uh, today uh, using the uh, work of Mary Louise von Franz in particular, who's the uh, great uh, expert, Jungian expert on the interpretation of fairy tales from a Jungian perspective. And the third question is how can uh, fairy tales be used in clinical practice? And um, uh, I will discuss that in some way, sometimes tangentially, and John Hill will address it very directly in, uh, in the last two seminars. So there are three questions. Why do we study them? How do we interpret them? And how can they be used in clinical practice? That's what we're going to try to uh, investigate. Now, the outline for the seminar um, will be, as I say, in these five sections. The first one today is an introduction to the interpretation of fairy tales. And I've listed a couple of readings that I suggest uh, you do and perhaps uh, watch this uh, uh, webinar again after you've done these readings, because I'm leaning very heavily on, on both of them. Uh, I will quote from them a bit, but uh, it would be much better if you had them tucked away in the back of your minds uh, as well, or um, certainly uh, the, the book, The Interpretation of Fairy Tales by von Franz is a, a basic text uh, in Jungian approach to fairy tales. And uh, my uh, essay, The White Snake, A Psychological Hero's Journey, uh, published in uh, a volume called Psyche's, Psyche Stories, uh, volume three, which I'll show you in a couple of minutes. Um, when I'm also going to uh, try to use uh, the method that von Franz uh, outlines in her book uh, to take you through this fairy tale in a very abbreviated way. You can read more about it in my essay. Uh, in the second session, we're going to look at Jung and two fairy tales. Uh, one that he interprets, uh, the spirit Mercurius. It's found in Collected Works, Volume 13. Uh, and the second is a uh, an original fairy tale that he actually includes in the Red Book uh, in a section called The Magicians toward the end of uh, Liber Secundus. Uh, I can give you page numbers, but it depends a bit on the uh, edition that you're using. Um, the um, <clears throat> Uh, and, and we will take a look at that to, um, uh, yeah, I do need this, I do need it, I do need it. Um, and then in the third session, we're going to um, 
look at the work of another uh, renowned Jungian named Erich Neumann, uh, who uh, wrote a whole book on a fairy tale. The fairy tale he addresses is an old one from a classical period, from a Hellenistic period, uh, called Amor and Psyche. Um, and it's uh, uh, embedded in a work called The Golden Ass of Apuleius. Uh, von Franz also interprets this fairy tale in her um, work on The Golden Ass of Apuleius. Uh, Neumann writes a whole book about it and focuses on the issue of feminine development. So we'll review his work in the, in the third section, Erich Neumann on Amor and Psyche. And then in the fourth and fifth seminars, John Hill will take over and he will explain a method that he has developed and uses in the training program at ISAP and other places, uh, uh, applying or using psychodrama uh, and working with fairy tales. And uh, also his experience, he will discuss his experience of teaching uh, interpretation of fairy tales in various settings. That's the outline of the seminar series. Now today, uh, in this first seminar, we'll first of all look at some Jungian writings on fairy tales, interpretation of fairy tales. Secondly, we will uh, look at the work of Marie-Louise von Franz, who is considered the doyen of Jungian interpreters of fairy tales. And we'll look at her method for interpreting fairy tales. And then we will, um, uh, go through uh, a Grimm's fairy tale, The White Snake, and I will make an attempt to apply von Franz's method uh, to the interpretation of that fairy tale. So that's our session for today, an outline of our first seminar. Now, some Jungian writings on fairy tales. A lot of Jungians have written about fairy tales, uh, and I can't um, put a, a list of all of them here. These are some of the more important ones, uh, some of the more significant, at least in the English language. But if you go out into other languages, German, French, Italian, Japanese, uh, you'll find uh, other Jungians <clears throat> taking up the theme of fairy tales and interpreting them in their own culture and in their own fashion, but using basic, basically a Jungian methodology. Uh, the list I have here, C.G. Jung, as I mentioned earlier, the spirit Mercurius that he takes up in volume, uh, in an essay called The Spirit Mercurius. It was originally a, an Eranos lecture uh, in the 1930s. Um, and we'll look at that in some detail next time. And then Marie uh, Louise von Franz's uh, works in fairy tales. Now you see quite a, a list of books here. Uh, the symbolism of fairy tales was an early work, and I'll, I'll say some more about that in a, in a moment, uh, which he wrote uh, with uh, another author named Hedwig von Beit. Um, and that was a, a very deep scholarly uh, research uh, of fairy tales from all over the world, thematizing them, looking at motifs and, and uh, uh, taking a, a Jungian view and Jungian interpretation of what they found in fairy tales from all around the world. It's a big two volume series. Uh, the other uh, works that you see here, and I'll just list them, the interpretation of fairy tales, which I recommend for today, Anima and Animus in fairy tales, archetypal patterns in fairy tales, Shadow and Evil in Fairy Tales, Individuation in Fairy Tales, and then of course The Golden Ass of Apuleius, uh, where she discusses Amor and Psyche. And her last work, The Cat, A Tale of Feminine Redemption, based on a fairy tale. Now almost all of these, with the exception perhaps of the last one, The Cat, and the first one, The Symbolism of Fairy Tales, are not actually books that she wrote. These are works that she Lecture that she gave um, orally uh, in her seminars at the CGM Institute in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. And I attended some of these and it was astonishing to see her at work. She would 
sit down, open the book, read the fairy tale, close the book, and start talking. Uh, and there was a woman uh, sitting in the front row, uh, assiduously making notes and uh, taking shorthand of everything she said. Uh, those notes were later turned into a transcript. Von Franz glanced through it briefly, made a few corrections, and the book they were printed as books. Von Franz, I mean, she talked in paragraphs. She talked in very complicated and uh, articulate uh, uh, sentences. Her thoughts were very clear. Um, and so those, in a, uh, in a sense, aren't created as books. They are notes from her fairy tale lectures. Um, and um, they cover a wide variety of themes in Jungian psychology, as you see, anima, synonyma, shadow, archetypal patterns, individuation, feminine redemption, feminine development, and so on. Uh, so you can see that uh, uh, Dr. Von Franz, uh, deeply immersed in the study of fairy tales, found them of great value in discussing Jungian psychology. And we will see why in just a few moments. And then uh, there's a three volume um, set that Cairo Publications uh, published some years ago in the 1990s called Psyche Stories, volume one, two, and three. There are some 20 authors uh, involved. These are contemporary Jungian analysts. Uh, Lionel Corbett and I are the editors, and uh, my paper on the White Snake is in the third volume. Uh, Robert Bly has a, a paper in the first volume, um, and uh, he, I think he's the only non-analyst who wrote for uh, the series. And then there's Hans Diekmann. He is a German analyst. Uh, he was the president of the IAP in the 1980s. And he wrote a, a highly, a very widely referenced work um, called The Favorite Fairy Tale from Childhood. And this is a technique that he developed in his practice that he would ask his patients, what was your favorite fairy tale from childhood? And since he was practicing in Germany, most of his patients could come up with one very readily that their grandmother had told them or their mother or father. Uh, it was still a fairy tale culture today. It probably isn't so much <clears throat> anymore. The classic fairy tales, the grim fairy tales, and so on. And then he would take this uh, favorite fairy tale from childhood and think about it, reflect on it as kind of uh, laying out some fundamental patterns of that person's individuation process and development. Didn't push it, didn't push it hard, but kept, kept it in the back of his mind as a reference. And he writes a very interesting essay on this subject. And then more recently, there were, uh, in, the, in the 1990s and early 2000s, I guess these two books, uh, Pinkola Estes and Robert Bly, were from the 1990s, very popular works in American culture, at least, and translated into many other languages based on fairy tales. Clarissa Pinkola Estes wrote her book, Women Who Run With the Wolves. Uh, she says that she couldn't find a publisher for it for a long time, when it was rejected by 15 or 20 until somebody picked it up, and then they ran with Clarissa Pinkola Estes, and boy, did they ever hit a home run. Um, they ran around the bases several times. That book sold in the millions, I think, and translated into 20 or 30 languages. <clears throat> so uh, uh, it was a way of approaching psychology, particularly for women um, uh, who were struggling to find their voices, find their identities, to um, step out from cultural conditioning and become themselves. And uh, these stories were very appealing to a very, very wide audience. And then Robert Bly, coming from the other side, from the masculine part of the men's movement, wrote his book, Iron John, and that also became a bestseller. And uh, Again, uh, the use of a fairy tale to speak about people's lives uh, in a way that really touches their experience, their soul, their, uh, their, their longings, their desires, their frustrations, their problems. Uh, these uh, tales, sometimes called wonder tales, the fairy tales, have an uncanny way of uh, expressing our lives. And uh, a good interpreter uh, can 
pick an appropriate fairy tale for you or me or, or our times and um, give you a very interesting uh, interpretation of the fairy tale and the subject that they're looking at in light of the fairy tale and in terms of the fairy tale. Fairy tales can often teach us something, uh, something about ourselves, something about perhaps our hangups and our problems, and sometimes even indicate a way forward if we're stuck. Uh, this is the Chiron book, uh, Psyche Stories, as you can see, modern Jungian interpretations of fairy tales. And this is the table of contents. And here are the, uh, some of the authors and, their, and the titles of their essays. You can look at those at your leisure sometime. Now, why do Jungians read fairy tales? <clears throat> um, this is uh, from von Franz's interpretation of fairy tales, and she says, we must begin by asking why in Jungian psychology we are interested in myths and fairy tales. And she combines the two terms here, myths and fairy tales, but she will make an important distinction between them. And then she uh, makes reference to a conversation she had <clears throat> with C.G. Jung. Dr. Jung, she goes on, once said that it is in fairy tales that one can best study the comparative anatomy of the psyche. In myths or legends or any other more elaborate mythological material, we get at the basic patterns of the human psyche through a lot of cultural material. But in fairy tales, there is much less specific cultural conscious material. And therefore, they mirror the basic patterns of the psyche more clearly. And this is um, probably the most fundamental rationale that uh, Jungians will give for uh, why we study fairy tales. It, there's a kind of scientific interest uh, alluded to here by von Franz. Uh, it's like studying comparative anatomy. If you go to medical school, you want to learn uh, how is the body uh, basically put together uh, and uh, how, uh, uh, how is the, the human as such? Comparative anatomy compares all humans so that it, no matter what person you're treating, where the, wherever they come from, if they walk into your office, you're a doctor, you will know where to look for a liver, a heart, how to take a pulse, uh, if a bone is broken, how to set it, uh, which bone it is. Uh, so no matter if they come from China, Japan, Africa, uh, South America, Europe, uh, you'll be able to treat them. Uh, comparative anatomy means anatomy that belongs to everybody. And so this is a comparative anatomy of the psyche. It's studying the psyche as such, the psyche that belongs to everybody, or what Jung would call the collective unconscious. Now, fairy tales um, and the collection of fairy tales uh, have uh, quite an extensive history in, uh, in European culture and Western cultures, especially, <clears throat> but worldwide uh, nowadays. Uh, one of the earliest uh, were the Brothers Grimm, who uh, collected stories from uh, people in a certain part of Germany, simply writing down what they were telling their children, what they had heard from their parents, and so on. And these are the, it's probably the most famous single collection of fairy tales. Uh, ever made, the fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm. Um, and uh, what I'm showing you here is the title page from a very special edition of that. The illustrations are by a famous uh, English uh, artist named Arthur Rackham. Um, and I'll show you some pictures uh, from that. Here, for instance, is a Rackham uh, drawing painting of an old king and a child. Uh, you see the old king dancing on his spindly legs, an old woman ho holding the baby, and they're rejoicing that there is new life coming into the kingdom. Uh, here's a fairy tale cat by Rackham walking on a ledge. Um, animals are, are frequent uh, um, denizens of fairy tales, uh, and as we'll see in the White Snake, a number of animals play a very important role. Here's a dwarf by Rackham. Uh, again, uh, uh, the images that these illustrators 
uh, drew were um, became uh, more or less the archetypal images uh, of these figures that uh, later entered the movies and uh, film and so on, and that we associate with such characters. If you read about a dwarf in a fairy tale, maybe something like this will come to your mind. There's a hero on his horse at the, at the side and the little dwarf telling him something of importance. Uh, there's a wonderful collection of fairy tales, Russian fairy tales, and another great illustrator named Boris Sorkin. And this is a collection called The Firebird. And if you look at it carefully, you'll see that Jacqueline Onassis uh, was the editor of this uh, series. In her later years, she worked as an editor in New York. And Sorkin was uh, a marvelous artist. Here you see uh, a picture of the cover of Vasilisa the Fair, a Russian fairy tale. And um, here's uh, from the fire, a firebird scene by Sorkin. And here's a snow maiden. Uh, again, these are snow maiden uh, by Sorkin. Uh, fantastic images that capture the imagination. And of course, these picture books are very popular in certain parts of the world. And not only with children. Here's the famous witch Baba Yaga flying in her pestle uh, through the woods. She's the great Russian witch. Uh, every Russian child has heard about Baba Yaga. And here's a wise old man by Zorkin, the old man in the woods with his bear. So you get, you start, if you look at these pictures, you also have the feeling of being in a magical world, in an archetypal world. And that's where fairy tales really take you to. They, they take you into another world called uh, the wonder world or a magical world. Uh, they're called wonder tales sometimes. Um, and in that world, stories develop, stories are told and narratives are uh, depicted which show themes from human life, themes that uh, we will recognize, we can associate to and themes that are very useful for the interpretation of uh, the magical world that we all carry around in ourselves in the unconscious that we dream about. So for Jungian students and training institutes, <clears throat> learning how to interpret fairy tales is very instructive for uh, interpreting dreams and helps them to identify archetypal themes in dreams that come to them from their patients. Um, to train your eye in archetypal motifs, there's probably no better uh, study than the study of fairy tales. And that's why uh, Mary Louise von Franz was so keen on them and why she dedicated so much of her um, uh, years as a, um, as a teacher and lecturer at the Jung Institute uh, to the study of fairy tales. And uh, here's a, photograph of her. She lived uh, uh, a good long life, born in 1915 and died in 1996. This is a picture taken of her probably in her 60th year or so and thereabouts. That's more or less the von Franz I knew when I came to Zurich and trained there in 1969 to 1973. Now here she is in 1968 lecturing at Bailey Island and you can see how she loved to teach. Uh, she is full of uh, herself and her ideas, and she's having a great time. And that's the von Franz uh, that I knew and that I would see uh, behind the lectern at the uh, Jung Institute in Zurich back in the early 1970s. Um, she was a grand lady indeed. And uh, a, um, an homage to her was created by uh, a very close student of hers, um, Emmanuel Kennedy, called The Fountain of the Love of Wisdom, an homage to Marie Louise von Franz. It's a collection of 40 or 50 short essays by students of his, of hers, admirers of hers. It's published uh, by uh, Chiron Publications. And uh, it's, it's well worth reading. It has photographs and pictures of her uh, through her whole lifespan, from her childhood to her old uh, later years. She suffered from Parkinson's disease at the end of her life. Um, 
and became very infirm, but uh, never did take any medication for it because she didn't want to cloud her mind. And she continued interpreting alchemy, alchemical texts through the very last days of her life. Now, I just want to mention her first book. Um, I'm not going to do very much with it. Uh, it hasn't been translated into English yet, but it is in the, in the process of being translated. Uh, Tony Wolfson um, is very involved in this translation, and he was kind enough to send me uh, the uh, table of contents as it will appear in the English version. Uh, this book was published in 1952 in Switzerland and Germany, in German. And the name of the author uh, on the book is Hedwig von Beit. Um, there are various versions of what happened uh, uh, to uh, von Franz's name and why it didn't appear on the book. But it's generally known that she did most of the research and most of the writing in this book. And for some reason, she backed out of the publication of it and it was given to von Beit to bring out to the public. Um, in the translated version, uh, in English, von Franz's name will appear on the book. Um, and what these two ladies did uh, back in the 1940s uh, was to investigate uh, in great detail fairy tales from all parts of the world and to draw up um, a kind of a summary of uh, themes, motifs, uh, and uh, images, symbols, um, into a kind of encyclopedia of the symbols of fairy tales. So it falls into two parts. There's the first book, as you can see here, that's titled The Profane and Magical World and Its Main Characteristics. Uh, and the second book is titled The Quest. Um, we have much more detail about the contents of the first book than the second book. And there you see uh, the place of the magical and all these uh, various items, the indefinite place, the moon, the hole in the earth or cave, the spring, water, the island. And in the volume, each of these has a long commentary with the Jungian interpretation. Then uh, part B, the leading characters of the magical. So these are some of the main figures that appear in the in fairy tales worldwide, the demonic father, the great mother, the image of the demonic son, the enchanting daughter, and so on. There probably will be more items there. And then in the second book, titled The Quest, we have the hero's journey and the maiden's journey. And uh, this, uh, what this book does is summarize uh, the main themes, images, and motifs from fairy tales worldwide. And I think it will be an important event, event when they are when that book is translated into English, hopefully soon. Now, here are a couple of quotations, three quotations that I want to read to you and um, uh, just spend a little time with there from The Interpretation of Fairy Tales by Marie-Louise von Franz. And again, they give her basic view of what is a fairy tale and uh, um, uh, from a psychological point of view, what does, it, what does a fairy tale mean and what does it say? So in this first um, quotation, which comes from the very beginning of the book, she starts off with a very powerful general statement. Fairy tales are the purest and simplest expression of collective unconscious psychic processes. So that is a fundamental presupposition that she will work from throughout her interpretation of fairy tales, that what they what fairy tales do is express something about the collective unconscious and its psychic processes. Um, so the reference uh, that she uh, uses, where, what are fairy tales pointing toward, or what are they telling us? Uh, where do we look uh, for their meaning? Uh, it has to do with the collective unconscious. Now, if you know a little Jungian theory, you realize that is 
a general level of the unconscious that belongs to all human beings worldwide. And it is the home of the archetypal images and uh, archetypal processes. So what fairy tales are telling us about is the archetypes, the archetypal images. She goes on, therefore, their value for the scientific investigation of the unconscious exceeds that of all other material. Very strong statement. Scientific investigation. If you want to investigate the collective unconscious scientifically, uh, that is uh, thoughtfully, rationally, uh, um, and uh, really do some uh, uh, deep research in the collective unconscious. Where do you look? Well, go to fairy tales. Uh, von Franz would say, they represent the archetypes in their simplest, barest, and most concise form. In this pure form, the archetypal images afford us the best clues to the understanding of the processes going on in the collective psyche. Very strong statement. That's her first paragraph of her book. Later, she says, and this is a personal statement. She's been reflecting on fairy tales for quite a long time. And she's, of course, uh, she wasn't at all limited to the study of fairy tales. She also studied alchemy and she studied mythology and world religions and uh, all those subjects. Um, and here she says uh, what the fairy tale is like to her. She says, to me, like a personal confession, the fairy tale is like the sea. And the sagas and myths are like the waves upon it. A tale rises to be a myth and sinks down again into being a fairy tale. Here again, we come to the same conclusion. Fairy tales mirror the more simple, but also more basic structure, the bare skeleton of the psyche. So she repeats uh, what she said before, but in a lovely way, uh, thinking of the fairy tale like the sea. And it gives rise to sagas and myths. They rise to the surface. They're uh, products of culture, um, Greek mythology, Egyptian mythology, Chinese mythology, and so on, Indian mythology. And they're much more culturally conditioned. And once they wear out, they fall back down into the sea and revert to their more basic form, their more ba basic archetypal patterns, which is the fairy tale. So the fairy tale is the underlying, most basic uh, expression of the uh, uh, structures and processes of the psyche, the collective psyche. And then another quotation for us, the study of fairy tales is very important because they depict the general human basis, because the fairy tale is beyond cultural and racial differences. It can migrate so easily. That's why fairy tales can pass from one culture to another without great difficulty, because they don't carry with them a lot of cultural associations. They're stripped bare, in other words. Fairy tale language seems to be the international language of all mankind, of all ages, and of all races and cultures. Uh, when I read this, it did give me a thought that uh, one, one wonders what can, you, what can Jungian psychology contribute to the problems of the world today, globalization and uh, collision of cultures and religions and so on. And von Franz would say, well, all of that uh, business, uh, the, the wars, religious wars and uh, struggles about uh, differences of culture and and manners and, and habits and so on are surface phenomena. Underneath all of that, we are very similar to each other. We are all human beings. Uh, and we are motivated by very similar motivations. We are driven by very similar archetypal patterns. We embody very similar archetypal features in our lives and our individuation processes. If we could get below the surface, we would find companionship with each other, we would find that the others who look so different and seem so different aren't really so different. So one could say that the study of fairy tales from a Jungian perspective, at least, is a way of establishing the commonality of mankind, that we're all 
more or less in the same boat of, or of a single species. And we have a lot in common, which remains hidden uh, under all the cultural accoutrements that we collect in the course of our uh, conditioning and upbringing and experience in, in our own personal lives. Now here's a drawing of levels of psyche. I'm sure many of you have seen this before in various contexts. And uh, with level A being the highest, uh, uh, most individual uh, aspect, the ego consciousness of the individual, and then goes down to family level of, of, of consciousness of the unconscious, and then the tribal and nation, ethnic group, primitive human ancestors going down, down uh, the, uh, through the levels, and animal ancestors, and at the very bottom, central energy. And uh, von Franz would say that uh, uh, fairy tales belong somewhere down there, probably uh, E, F, G, even animals share uh, many of the patterns and appear in many of the fairy tales. They can speak and they can be helpers or, or uh, uh, opponents uh, of the human in fairy tales, but nevertheless uh, companionable and uh, uh, part of the whole picture. Um, animal, the animal level, uh, animal ancestors also belong to our psyches, as does uh, the primitive human ancestors, the Neanderthals and the cave dwellers and, and so on from thousands and thousands of years ago. We carry all of that material in our psyches, although we live most of the time up there at the top in uh, that little circle A. Now, Many other scholars have also recognized that uh, fairy tales are universal, that, that the, it's, it's uh, hard to explain of the similarity from culture to culture of fairy tales, why they are so similar. Uh, and Jack Zipes, who is a, a, an American academic, uh, very well known for his books on fairy tales, um, uh, wrote a book called The Irresistible Fairy Tale quite interesting, uh, and many others. And this is from a short interview uh, that he gave to uh, a journalist uh, in which he answers the question uh, which the journalist asked him, uh, uh, are, are fairy tales similar worldwide? And if so, why? He says, it is uncanny how similar tales, how similar tales are throughout the world. How has this come about? Campbell, it's Joseph Campbell, would probably use Jung and collective unconscious to explain their origin. He demurs and says he doesn't uh, go along with that explanation, but then he continues in, in a way that isn't so terribly different. He says, I've recently been exploring Darwin, social Darwinism, sociobiology, and evolutionary psychology. And here you get the, the, the picture of those levels and layers. And I'm gradually coming to the conclusion that there are basic instincts in the human species that are the same throughout the world. Well, this is uh, another way of saying what von Franz was saying. There are basic patterns, he calls them instincts here. Um, the instincts and dispositions, again, very close to what is a disposition if not an archetypal uh, pattern, the instincts and dispositions have evolved genetically and are articulated through mental and public representations in response to a civilizing process. That means they become, they become more conscious uh, as human beings enter into culture. Given that the instinct and dispositions that <clears throat> evolve genetically are the same, but altered by the environment, we are bound to feel the world and respond to the world in very similar ways. So again, the point is how similar we are worldwide at some level. And when we get to telling stories, particularly fairy tales, this comes out very strongly. And uh, in his book on uh, uh, the irresistible fairy tale, Jack Zipes quotes another scholar, Walter Burkhardt, who is a professor of uh, ethnology and anthropology and religious uh, studies at the University of Zurich written many books, especially on Greek 
religion and Greek mythology. Um, Zipes quotes him uh, along very similar lines where Burkert says, the process of semiosis, the use of signs and symbols, operates within the whole sphere of living organisms and was evidently invented long before the advent of man. So he's making reference to that animal level uh, in the diagram that uh, I showed you a minute ago. This does not mean that genes prescribe culture, clearly they do not, but it could be said that they, genes, give recommendations. And this is what exactly what Jung said about archetypes. Archetypes don't determine anything, don't prescribe anything, but they give recommendations. They are uh, proclivities, predispositions to think and feel and imagine in certain ways. So Burkert is practically quoting him here. They can be said to give recommendations that become manifest in the repetition of the patterns. The kinds of memories most easily recalled, the emotions they are most likely to evoke. The biological makeup forms conditions or attractors. You can think about archetypes as attractors also. To produce phenomena in a conscious fashion, even if these patterns are created and recreated afresh in each case. What can be shown is the near universality and persistence of patterns through place and time, and the existence of certain analogies or even homologies in structure and function in animal behavior. Um, so here he's comparing human and uh, animal behavior, that there are homologies and uh, analogies uh, between human behavior and structure and animal behavior and structure. This suggests that details and sequences in rituals, tales, works of art, and fantasies hark back to more original processes in the evolution of life. And this harking back to more original processes, a Jung, Jungians would say uh, something like they echo archetypal patterns that uh, are pre-existent before even humans appear on the scene in uh, the life of the earth. So there's some confirmation from scholars who are not at all committed to Jungian ideas or uh, even reference Jung, but uh, one would say that they've come to similar conclusions. Now I want to talk about a method for um, interpreting fairy tales that von Franz lays out in her book on the interpretation of fairy tales. And I'm going to talk about three uh, aspects of this method. Uh, the aspect of structure, how fairy tales are structured, the method of amplification, working with the images that appear in fairy tales, and the application of psychological theory to uh, the fairy tale in order to get an interpretation. So we begin with von Franz, where she lays out her method for interpreting fairy tales. How do we wed? How do we? Um, that's a missed, uh, type, typographical error. There. How do we approach the meaning of a fairy tale? She asks, or stalk it rather, because it really is like stalking a very evasive stag. This is von Franz on page thirty-seven of interpretation of fairy tales. She wants to talk about stalking the fairy tale, uh, that the fairy tale is evasive. It's, it's hard to pin down. Uh, it's very much like a dream. You never come to uh, an interpretation of a dream where you can say, that's it. Finally, we've got everything. Uh, we've nailed it uh, to the board. No, uh, it will wiggle out every time and there will always be another angle and another uh, perspective. So. She's treating fairy tales very much like that. Uh, we have to stalk them. So um, it isn't a, a question of saying exactly what the fairy tale means. It means approaching the fairy tale, getting close to it, spotting it, spotting it in the woods, and maybe getting to know it a little better and getting to know its underlying significance uh, for the human a little better. Then she goes on, just as for a dream, we divide the archetypal story, that is the fairy tale, into, into the four stages of the classical drama. This is what Jung taught about uh, dream interpretation. Think of, of um, 
classic drama and its divisions into uh, um, uh, the uh, beginning, the, the dramatis personae, uh, and the uh, uh, development of the theme, the climax, the lysis, the uh, catastrophe or conclusion, whatever. And she names these four as follows. First of all, think about time and place. Where is the fairy tale located? It's always in, in the uh, uh, once upon a time land. It's always in a magical world, but it might be in a kingdom, it might be in the woods, it might be a, a cottage in the, in the forest, whatever. So make a note of the time and the place uh, uh, when you're um, looking at the structure of the fairy tale. Then the dramatis personae, that is, who's in the tale? Uh, who are the characters? And she says, I recommend counting the number of people at the beginning and the end, and this will come up again. Look at who's there in the beginning uh, uh, and who's missing and uh, who appears at the end who's missing in the beginning. So again, that's uh, uh, a way of uh, beginning to think about what's going on in the fairy tale. Who are the characters in it? And then there is the naming the problem. She says the fairy tale will very quickly come to the point where it shows you the problem. There's a problem here, and it's a problem that uh, will be worked on in the remainder of the, of the fairy tale. If there weren't a problem, there would be no story, of course. Uh, every novelist knows that. You've got to create problems in your story and make them dramatic and exciting and cliffhanging. Otherwise, nobody's going to read your novel. It would be a rather boring story. Uh, at least most novels are like that. So there is a problem that has to be solved in the fairy tale. And then there is what she calls the peripatia. And that's the main part of the fairy tale. That's the ups and downs of the story, as she said. And you generally uh, come to uh, the climax, the decisive point, where either the whole thing develops into a tragedy or it comes out right. And then there is a lysis or sometimes a catastrophe. So that's the... Uh, the storyline, what happens, uh, the hero goes through various adventures, uh, solves the problem, comes back, uh, is rewarded, marries the princess, so on and so forth. That would be a happy ending, and sometimes there's a catastrophe. Everything falls apart, and it ends in a disaster. Um, so this is the way to look at the structure of the fairy tale. Look at the time and place, who's in it, what's the problem, and then follow the development and see what happens at the end. She says, we should remember especially to count the characters and to notice the number symbolism and the part it plays. So von Franz was very interested in number symbolism, as you, many of you probably know. She wrote a book called Number and Time um, and uh, uh, was very keen on uh, symbolism of numbers, as was Jung. Uh, Jung wrote his famous essay on the, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity uh, and uh, comments extensively on the numbers one, two, and three there, of course, and also in Maria Prophetisa's alchemicals um, uh, saying from the one comes the two, and from the two, the three, and out of the three comes the one as the fourth. So one, two, three, four. Um, number symbolism has a long history, and uh, there are many commentators on it, and von Franz is one of uh, the outstanding ones uh, who takes uh, the, the view that numbers have uh, represent quality as, as well as quantity. And she looks at the quality of the numbers and what the numbers signify, what is the quality of the number one, number two, number three, and seven, eight, ten, and so on. Looking at the emotional side of numbers and the symbolic side of numbers rather than the arithmetic, mathematical side of numbers. And then she says, uh, second step is we have to uh, amplify the characters. Uh, we have to look at the comparative material before we can say anything definite. So this is a second step. Um, after the, the structure has been noted, then you look at the characters and you begin the process of amplification. That is, comparative material is brought to bear on the fairy tale. So if you have uh, the image of a snake, as we do in the white snake, you would go to a symbol dictionary, or as I did to Hastings Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, and there you find 
many, many pages of references to the image of the snake in world religions, of fairy tales, mythologies, and so on. <clears throat> That's uh, amplifying the image. We have to ask, she says, whether that motif occurs in other tales and how it is in other tales. And then take an average, and only then is our interpretation on a relatively secure basis. So you're broadening the perspective on an individual fairy tale by amplifying the various characters, persons, uh, images in the fairy tale. Amplification means enlarging through collecting a quantity of parallels. When you have a collection of parallels, then you pass on to the next motif, and in this way, go through the whole story. So this is the second step uh, in the interpretation, amplification. Well, you can see that uh, interpreting a fairy tale is going to be quite, become quite a project. Therefore, she can write whole books or give long series of uh, lectures on a single fairy tale because she has so much, uh, uh, she had an encyclopedic memory. She could remember a thousand fairy tales and give you references to all of them. Um, so uh, 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 method of amplification was very important to von Franz. And when you saw her do it uh, alive, you could hardly believe that anybody uh, was uh, capable of such a feat of, of memory and association, so wide, so broad and so deep from all regions of the world. And then she said there are two more steps after amplification. Next, we have to construct the context. Let's say that in a fairy tale, there is a mouse and you have amplified it, but you see that this mouse behaves in a specific way. So what she means by this, the context is, in this particular fairy tale, how does the animal or the person behave uh, in reference to many other options. And later in the same paragraph, she says, I try to find uh, the one that fits my mouse and I put the rest in my pocket. And then I see a little later in the fairy tale, another kind of mouse comes up and then I've got those in there and I can use them and I can put the two together and then presto, I get an answer. So that's how she worked. So this is creating the context, what she calls constructing the context. And then finally, there comes the last essential step, which is the interpretation itself. And this is a psychological interpretation. This is where we uh, are, this is the final goal of, of this whole project to, to come up with a psychological interpretation. Um, and that is the task of translating the amplified story, as we've been working on it, into psychological language. So she says, uh, one way of saying uh, the result is the terrible mother who is overcome by the hero. Okay, that's, that's, uh, that's what the story is about, the terrible mother overcome by the hero. And that phrase becomes the inertia of unconsciousness is overcome by an impulse toward a higher level of consciousness. There you see the uh, translation from the language of image to the language of psychological uh, psychological concepts and awareness. So instead of talking about uh, the, the terrible mother, you talk about the inertia of the unconscious. Uh, and instead of calling, uh, talking about the hero as such, you talk about an impulse toward a higher level of consciousness. That's what the hero does. The hero brings higher level of consciousness. And as we'll see in the white snake, uh, the hero has an urge to uh, overcome the inertia of unconsciousness at every step of the way become more conscious and bring a new consciousness into the world. So those are the steps of interpretation. And then finally, von Franz summarizes it. And I find this statement uh, very useful in thinking about the message of fairy tales um, in general, as well as the message of mythologies, religions, uh, dream series and uh, individuation, many other aspects of um, our psychology. Uh, she writes, after working for many years in this field, so she's been at it for quite a long time by the time she writes this, I have come to the conclusion that all fairy tales endeavor to describe one and the same psychic fact but a fact so complex and far-reaching 
and so difficult for us to realize in all its different aspects that hundreds of tales and thousands of repetitions with a musician's variations are needed until this unknown face is delivered into consciousness. That shouldn't be unknown face, I think unknown fact. This unknown fact is what Jung calls the self, which is the psychic totality of an individual and also paradoxically the regulating center of the collective unconscious. Every individual and every nation has its own modes of experiencing this psychic reality. That is a very, very fundamental uh, presupposition that she has in the back of her mind whenever she picks up an individual fairy tale. She's going to ask herself the question, how does this fairy tale make manifest some facet, some aspect of this huge and complex fact that's trying to become conscious among us. So it's as though that sea that she talks about, the fairy tale is like the sea, is motivated or under the sea, there is a, a force that wants to become conscious, that wants to rise to the surface and generates a whole lot of stories about itself uh, so that we, like the blind who are, are grasping the elephant and describing it, I might at some point in the far distant future come to an awareness of the whole fact it's, as it is in itself. Um, and I'm sure this is what von Franz thought about the whole endeavor of analytical psychology. The Jungian project is about trying to uncover this fact and understand it in the life of individuals when we study their individuation process. Uh, what uh, aspect of this gigantic fact is this life revealing to us? Or if we study cultures and all the characters in cultures, uh, all the stories that appear in cultures, all together, what is that story? What is the story of the United States and all of its mythologies and all of its, uh, its fairy tales? Paul Bunyan and the pioneers and the pilgrims and the astronauts and Obama and all of these characters, uh, you could say, form a single huge narrative, which is an attempt when we tell the story, talk about it, to reveal this gigantic fact that is trying to become uh, come into, into our consciousness through our telling of stories and retelling stories. We tell our dreams, our dreams say something about what's trying to become conscious in us. So now we're going to try to apply the method. And we don't have so much time, but I think we can get there. As I said, when von Franz would give lectures about fairy tales, she would start by telling you the fairy tale. And then she would go on and uh, give you her interpretation of the fairy tale, uh, her amplifications, her analysis, and so on. I'm doing it uh, more or less in reverse order. I'm going to tell you the fairy tale now, and then we'll have some minutes to uh, apply the method and see uh, if it works on this fairy tale. So this is the white snake. It's a Grimm's fairy tale. It's my favorite fairy tale of all time. I wrote about it. I've lectured about it many times. I love this story. And uh, I think I'm getting closer to knowing why I love it so much, because maybe I'm beginning to understand what it's trying to say about the sill. So here's the setting. A long time ago, there lived a king who was famous for his wisdom. Uh, please forgive the typos. I typed this in myself and uh, spell check doesn't catch this kind of thing. Um, there lived a king who was famous for his wisdom. Who was king, okay? In his kingdom, there were no secrets that he did not know about. It was an amazing kingdom. It was his practice every day after dinner to ask his trusty servant to bring him a covered dish. The servant then had to leave the room and no one knew what was on the dish for the king never lifted the cover until he was alone. That's the setting. Then the problems begin. One day, as the servant carries the dish out of the room, he is overcome with curiosity. Now, we have to watch this servant. He is the key player in the whole story. He takes it to his own room, closes the door, and lifts the cover. 
There on the platter, he sees a white snake. Having gone this far, he thinks he will also try tasting it. So he cuts off a bit of the snake and eats it. Suddenly, he here suddenly, as in dreams, is a turning point. This is one of the, this is the first major turning point in this story. There are several others, but this is a big one. So suddenly, he hears the voices chattering outside his window. It is the sparrows, and they are talking about what they have seen in the kingdom that morning. The servant has received the ability to understand the language of animals. The servant, therefore, is transformed. On the very day this happens, so simultaneously, is this cause and effect relationship or synchronistic? Anyway, on the same day, the queen loses her most precious ring and suspicion falls on the trusted servant because he is allowed to go everywhere in the palace. The king confronts him and threatens that if he does not produce the thief by tomorrow, he will be executed. Naturally, the servant protests his innocence, but it is of no use. So falsely accused, pushed into the corner. It is with a heavy heart, and notice this phrase because it's repeated several times in the story, the heavy heart of this man uh, in his despair. He goes out into the courtyard wondering how he will defend himself against this false accusation. Outside, he overhears some ducks having a quiet conversation as they smooth their feathers and take a rest beside the brook. They are discussing their breakfasts, and one of them says, something is bothering my stomach. I was eating too fast, and I swallowed a ring that was lying under the queen's window. The servant realizes this is the thief, so he grabs the duck and takes her to the cook, who, seeing what a nice fat bird she is, cuts off her head and prepares her for dinner. As he does so, he finds the queen's ring and the servant is exonerated. So we have a very good resolution to the story. Now the king is so sorry for his error and wants to make up for jumping to a false conclusion, so he offers the servant his choice of positions at court. But the servant turns down the offer and asks only for a horse and a little money. He wants to explore the world on his own a little. The king grants his request and the servant sets out. So this is the introduction to the fairy tale. It's uh, kind of like in, uh, in the book of Job, you have the scene in heaven. Uh, there is a problem, but the problem is resolved in this story, it seems. But this servant, uh, is, is uh, curious. He wants to know things. He, he's a kind of energy that wants to emerge into the world on his own. Okay, so first he tries the wet snake, and now he sets off, um, leaves the kingdom, leaves the security, leaves uh, uh, the known, and goes off into the unknown. So here the parapetia unfolds. There are three critical incidents that happen in the first part. First, after a time, he comes to a pond where he sees three fishes caught in reeds and dying for lack of water. Our hero, now he's not called the servant anymore, he's called the hero. So his identity has changed as a result of these alterations that he's made in his life. Our hero on horseback hears them complaining about their bad luck and has pity on them, freeing them and returning them to the pond. As he goes on his way, they cry out to him, we will remember you and repay you for saving us. So that's the first incident. Now here's a beautiful drawing by Racker, a Rackham, who uh, uh, shows the hero uh, freeing the fish from the reeds. That's in the book that I showed you earlier. So the second incident, he rides on and soon he overcome, overhears some tiny voices in the sand under his horse's hoofs. He stops to listen and hears an ant king complaining about the insensitive horse that is treading on his people without mercy. So the hero turns his horse off onto a side path. And as he passes the ant king, and as he passes the ant king, cries out to him, we will remember you. One good turn deserves another. It's the second incident. Third one, as he continues on his way, he comes upon two old ravens throwing their young out of their nest and screaming at them 
to learn to take care of themselves. These are children who don't want to grow up and leave the nest. But the poor little ravens are still young and helpless, and they fall to the ground where they cry out and complain that they will starve to death. So the good man, filled with compassion for the abandoned young ravens, dismounts, kills his horse with his sword, and lets the little birds feed on its carcass. With gratitude, they cry out, we will remember you. One good turn deserves another. So these are the three incidents with the fish, the ants, and the birds, the ravens. Now the hero must go on ahead on his own two legs. So you see how the individuation process goes forward. After a time, he enters a large city and hears an announcement in the streets that the king's daughter is looking for a husband. Whoever would seek her hand must complete, must compete, complete a hard task, however, and if he fails, he will forfeit his life. The young man hears that many have already failed. Nevertheless, when he sees the princess, he is smitten by her beauty. There's the beautiful uh, young woman that Van Franz writes about. And despite the grave risk, he presents himself as a suitor. The hard task follows. Now we get the three tasks. The king takes him down to the sea and tosses a gold ring into the waves. The task is to bring the ring back up out of the choppy waters. What is more, he will, he will be thrown back into the sea until he either comes up with the ring or drowns. As the young man stands on the shore wondering what will become of him now, some fish suddenly surface whom he recognizes as the ones he had saved. One of them places a mussel at his feet, and when he opens it, he finds the ring. With great joy, he takes the ring to the king and asks for his reward. The princess is proud, however, and does not want to accept so humble a suitor. He was just nothing but a servant before, and she's a princess after all much too humble for the princess. So she proposes a second hard task. This time, she leads the way. In the garden, she opens 10 sacks filled with millet seed, which she scatters in the grass with her own hands. If the suitor has not returned every grain of millet to the sack by morning, he will be executed. Again, the young man feels helpless and wonders what will become of him. He sits in the garden through the night and as dawn lights the sky, he realizes that the sacks are full and not a single grain of millet has been left on the ground. The ant king has come to in the night with his subjects and they have repaid his earlier kindness. Yet when the princess comes out in the morning and sees that the task has been completed, her proud heart still resists. And so she poses a third hard task. If he wants to become her husband, the young man must bring her an apple from the tree of life. The suitor does not know where the tree of life is to be found, but he sets out anyway and walks for as long as his legs will carry him. He wanders through three kingdoms. Note all the threes in the story. And one evening he comes to a wood and lies down under a tree to sleep. In the branches above him, he suddenly hears some rustling and a golden apple falls into his hand. Three ravens follow it, fly down, and perch on his knee. They tell him that they are the ones he saved by killing his horse, and that when they heard about his quest for an apple from the tree of life, they flew over the sea to the end of the world where the tree stands and brought one back for him. And now we come to the lysis. The suitor carries the golden apple back to the princess, who now has no more cause to resist him. They cut the apple of life in two and eat it together. Then her heart opens and she becomes filled with love for him and they live in happiness to a great age. Now this is a story with a very happy outcome and let's apply the method and see what we can come up with. So first of all, the dramatis personae, who are they? Well, there's a servant who becomes a hero that's one character. He's the main character in the story, and he's the one whose storyline we follow. Um, Van Franz 
cautions us, uh, as do all Jungian teachers, and I'm sure John Hill uh, taught the same thing and teaches it in his classes, the hero is not to be identified with the ego. The hero is an archetype. The hero is the one who brings consciousness and brings light out of the darkness of the collective unconscious. And so we have to read him as an archetypal figure uh, showing an archetypal movement within the collective unconscious that's trying to get somewhere and do something. You know, it's a kind of energy that's emergent and uh, uh, moves forward in, in time and space to new uh, possibilities. That's the hero. So first the servant, he becomes the hero. Then we have two kings. We have the, uh, the first king who is a very wise king uh, uh, and yet makes a, a stupid mistake. Why doesn't he consult his wisdom? He should know better. And then you have the second king, who's the father of the princess. Uh, so two kings in the story. Then there's one queen. She's the wife of the first king, who uh, is responsible for casting doubt on the, uh, on, the, on the loyalty and trustworthiness of the servant. She's a rather treacherous figure, a little paranoid. Uh, not, not to be trusted. She's a problem figure, but she's a queen. So you have a king and a queen at the beginning with a servant. And then you have a princess, and she's the daughter of the second king. And so in the second kingdom, you have a king and a princess. You don't see a queen around anywhere. And then the hero appears, and uh, he forms the third figure of the, of the triad. Uh, so you've got two triads, one at the beginning and one at the end but with different characters in them. Uh, the difference being the queen and the princess. And then you have the animals uh, who are very important in this story. You have, a, first of all, the white snake, of course, and then you have the duck who is sacrificed. Um, you have a horse, which I didn't write in here, uh, should have. Uh, and then you have the fishes, ants, and ravens. And it's interesting, they come from three different areas of the uh, earth, uh, fishes from the water, ants from the earth, and ravens from the air. So they represent three different domains uh, of our world. Those are the dramatis personae. We've identified them. We could amplify them at great length, all of them. We don't have time for that. Uh, but uh, that would be the next step in the interpretation. Then von Franz says, be sure to notice numbers. So let's take a look at numbers. At the beginning, we have three characters plus, of course, the, the white snake, but I'm just counting the servant, the king, and the queen, the human characters. We have three at the beginning, and we have three at the end. We have the hero, the princess, and the king. Uh, we also have three interventions. Um, that is, um, uh, with, the, uh, with the fish, the ants, and the ravens, where he intervenes. Uh, on his journey, uh, makes a change, makes a difference. And we have three challenges uh, to fetch the ring, to uh, uh, gather all the seeds back into the sacks, and to get the golden apple from the tree of life. So the number three is extremely important in this story. We know that the number three uh, symbolizes a dynamic movement forward. It's a very dynamic tale. It goes somewhere, and it completes its mission it com in the end. It is a story of uh, success, uh, what it's set out to do. Now, if we look at the Parapataya and the Lysis, uh, what we find is at the beginning, you have a paradisal setting, a wise king, the queen and the servant. It's a kind of living in paradise. Uh, the snake, of course, as, as in the biblical paradise, makes the difference. Uh, and then the problem is eating the snake and suspicion and threat. So a problem appears rather early. That's the first problem. We get several problems in this fairy tale. But that one has a resolution, reconciliation with the old king. And the, the servant could have stayed. He could have stayed as a counselor, probably as a prime minister or something. But he decided to venture out onto his own. And then you have the theme here now of separation, which is so important in the individuation process. And in almost every fairy tale, you will get a moment of separation uh, where um, a decisive separation takes place. And this time it's his refusal to stay in the old kingdom, but to journey into the unknown. And now you have a quest, a quest story. Uh, so um, the, uh, 
the uh, paradisal setting is left behind. He leaves paradise and he goes on a quest into the unknown. He doesn't even know what he's looking for. He just wants to discover what's out there. And he does so in a very sensitive way. He's got a horse, he's riding on a horse, he has a little money. And in, the, in these three incidents, he establishes relationships with animals who become his friends and very helpful. And here we can see he makes contact with nature, the natural world, in three levels, the, the water, the land, and the air. And then there is the discovery of the goal of his quest. Now he knows what he's, what he's looking for. He doesn't at first, he's just looking around. Now he sees, ah, this is what I'm, what I'm after. He finds his uh, uh, target of his desire. He wants this princess when he sees her. Um, and so uh, now the, the challenge is, how, how is he going to uh, uh, realize the, the goal of his quest? He's challenged three times. He has to find the ring, gather the seeds, and get the golden apple from the tree of life. Remember, the snake is in the Garden of Paradise, and there were two trees there, the Garden of Knowledge of Good and Evil and the Tree of Life. Um, so he has to, in a sense, recover paradise uh, and by getting this apple from the Tree of Life, which he himself can't do. The ravens, who are the birds of the spirit, as Van Franz says, the ravens are the dark thoughts that lead us to God. Uh, the ravens bring the the a golden apple back to him. And so he has what he needs to uh, marry the princess and realize his, uh, uh, the goal of his quest. And the Lysis is sharing the golden apple, not just bringing it, but then sharing it. They cut it in half. And when that happens and they both eat of it, uh, they have a conuncio. So the uh, uh, hero and the princess are in love. Presumably they'll get married. Presumably he will inherit the kingdom. And so you have the prospect of a new king and queen, or the renewal of the kingdom. There is a future. Uh, we don't know what that future will be, but uh, certainly uh, uh, this kingdom has a future. We don't know what, about the first kingdom. Now, if we try to turn all of this into psychological interpretations, um, uh, we would have to reflect on uh, on this for quite a long time and in some detail, but I'm just going to offer three possibilities. Uh, they're at slightly different levels of abstraction. Uh, one has perhaps more to do with an individual um, process, um, developmental process, and the other two perhaps more with a collective. So I think we can see in the story the dynamics of the individuation process through the two great movements of individuation. I write about this in my book on the principle of individuation, that it proceeds by, uh, by the two movements, uh, separation and integration. And you see that in this fairy tale where the hero separates himself from the kingdom, goes on his journey, and in the end through marriage with the feminine, with the anima figure, he integrates um, uh, the other into uh, a new wholeness and uh, a set, uh, into a couple. And so that uh, this individuation is a uh, process of achieving wholeness through uniting conscious and unconscious within the individual psyche. Um, now, another way of, of looking at this at a more general level, a collective or cultural level, is that you can see the story as the emergence of a new collective attitude. Uh, the emergence and formation of a new king and queen pair, a new union of conscious and unconscious, or solar and lunar elements in the collective unconscious, which emerges into the collective consciousness realm. So the, the first kingdom is a, a collective setup that uh, is running pretty well, but it's old, it's established, and the second kingdom is the new kingdom with a new future. And the story of the Peripatai in between is the journey from one to the other. And this is a difficult journey. It's a, a journey through challenge, tribulation, trial, sacrifice. Uh, it's a movement from one type of cultural setup, a cultural consciousness, to another one. 
And it's a, a defined and clear process in the fairy tale story. Now, perhaps we can find examples of this kind of change from one cultural dominant to another cultural dominant in our own life experience, uh, in, in changes in our culture in, in the United States. I was thinking today, what does it mean that we now have, for the first time in the United States, an African-American as president, and perhaps in the next administration, we will have the first woman president. Uh, there's a pair. Uh, and it signifies, certainly Obama's uh, election and inauguration signifies a big shift in American culture and in consciousness. Uh, we don't know everything that it means. Uh, we don't really uh, aren't certain of its uh, deepest values but we know there is a change. So we can look at cultures and we can see there are transitions from one form, sort of from the Eisenhower America to the Obama America, something like that. Um, and in Europe, you can see the same thing. Sometimes these changes move through deep darkness and catastrophe, uh, as we saw in the, in the wars in, in Europe, through uh, two world wars, a new Europe has emerged but it was a very bad story, a very bad fairy tale. And the fairy tale we're dealing with, which is a, a movement from one cultural setup to another cultural setup, has challenges and sacrifices and dark nights of the soul and doubt and despair, but it comes out okay in the end and you have a beautiful connuncio and a new pair representing masculine and feminine in a, in a uh, new cultural setup. Uh, and then a third way of uh, interpreting this uh, from a Jungian perspective would be to see it as a movement of the self from unconscious to conscious realms. The emergence of the self realized in, at the end of a story is a syzygy. A syzygy is a pair, uh, a male-female pair that has entered into consciousness. Now, von Franz would say every fairy tale is something to do with the emergence of the self from its embeddedness in the matrix of the collective unconscious that rises through the sea of the unconscious and its levels into consciousness. And the, the uh, role of the hero, or what the hero symbolizes and uh, portrays for us is the energy that drives that process. And it comes out of the old kingdom. It comes out of the darkness. It is self-motivated. This is uh, 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 individuation takes place as a self-motivated feature of the psyche, uh, whether it's on an individual or a cultural level. The driving force behind it, the energy for it, the deepest motivation for it, comes out of the unconscious itself. It isn't created by the ego and the ego's wishes and desires. Uh, and so uh, in this uh, fairy tale, you could see the, the movement from uh, unconscious to consciousness and the achieved um, uh, uh, symbol of, of the pair of the wholeness at the end of it gives us a vision of what, um, if we can understand what it, what it means and what the, this hero has achieved, uh, gives us uh, a new vision and a new respect and perspective on, on the self. This fairy tale can teach us about the emergence of the self and what that looks like. So um, that uh, is my summary. Um, and I think uh, von Franz's method is a useful one for uh, interpreting fairy tales from a Jungian perspective. And uh, we will use it some more in our next sessions when we turn to what Jung does with fairy tales. It's two fairy tales, one that he interprets, one that he creates. Um, in the Red Book, and then we'll, in the third session, look at what Neumann does with fairy tales. Um, I think that will be my conclusion for today, and I hope to see you all in a few weeks for the second session. Great. Thank you so much, Murray. Let me turn down my volume a little bit. Um, what a marvelous introduction. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoy that. I know that uh, everybody else did as well. Love the new backdrop. That looked really nice. It's uh, neat to see other aspects of your home. Um, 
and such a great you know, interpretation of the, the white snake, you know, walking us right you know, through that. Uh, we would urge people to you know, read that chapter of the book. I believe that's volume three of the uh, sucky stories you know, here. And if you want to get to the full you know, piece of what uh, Murray just went through, you can read that in much more detail as well. And I'm pretty sure our promo page gets you a link if you want to get that book you know, at all. Um, so again, thank you, Murray. Thank you, audience, for, for attending. Um, we are meeting pretty much every two weeks, you know, for the, the next, you know, five sessions. I think the last one has a three-week you know, interval. So we'll be back in two weeks, and we'll continue with our interpretation of fairy tales. So thank you again, and we'll see you all in a couple weeks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.